and gather you from the lands in which you were scattered among them, with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and I will be judging with you there face to face. Just as I was judging your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will be judging you, declares Adonai Yahweh. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. What is he talking about? Shepherd and sheep, right? That the shepherd every night, literally, he would count the sheep. They would pass under the rod. Because the, every sheep had the mark of their shepherd. And he would count every last one to make sure that every one was there. I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Just like Andy was talking about today. You know, and like I said, the Shabbat returning to the family of the covenant. And I will purge from among you the rebels and the transgressors against me. I will bring them out of the land where they reside, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am Yahweh. So again, here we see again, we see a separation. We see that the believers in the end time coming from the wilderness. And I say there's two forms of wilderness in the end. I've done many uh, sermons on this in the past called the wilderness. There's a spiritual wilderness when all of us are coming out of paganized religion. You know, because again, you don't want to come out of the pot into the frying pan. And one of the big mistakes that many people make when they're coming out of organized religion is they jump out of organized religion here to jump into organized religion in Judaism. And it's like you're, you're, you're going from one pagan religion to another pagan religion because unfortunately Judaism is a pagan religion. You know, what I say is, when you look in the first century, you had a lot of righteous people, the Bible tells us that, and most of those righteous, pious people became followers of Yeshua. The ones who were left over, the ones who hated him, the scribes and the Pharisees who put him to death, started religion in the second century under Rabbi Akiva called modern-day Judaism. It's not the same religion of first century Judaism. I have tapes on this, and they're important to listen to. Because Rabbi Akiva was not a good man. And he changed the whole form of all Judaism. And it is. It, it, it's a structured religion to control man. And it's filled with mytholo mythological things. You know, the Talmud says that Akiva met Adam. How could he meet Adam? You know, Adam lived 3,000 years before that. Uh, just all kinds of wild-eyed crazy stories that you'll read in there. So, we don't want to jump out of the boiling pot into the frying pan. You don't want to go from one organized religion to another organized religion. What you want to do is you want to come out of organized religion, if it's not of Yahweh, and you want to come to the truth of the word. You know, the word is the word is the word, and that's what we'll see in the end here. We'll see that the bride of Messiah is one that is following the word. Whatever it takes them. And believe me, I, you know, I, I didn't grow up in this. You know, I was born into Catholicism. My family is heavily into Catholicism. They still are. And when I started coming into the truth, 16, 17, 18 years old, there were sparks flying across that Italian table. You know, you better believe it. <laughs> Meatballs going back and forth. But again, I, I was looking for the truth. And that's all that mattered. I talked to many people over the years. I've heard many, many thousands of testimonies. And many times people come to faith through trial. You know, it could be a death, it could be this. For me, it wasn't. I had the greatest life in the world. I was 18 years old. I was almost a millionaire. I owned my own business. I had 30 employees. I had everything you'd want in life. So the last thing I needed was religion. But all of a sudden, as this is starting to come to me, and I'm looking at it, it was the truth. And I said to myself, if this is true, I don't have a choice. Because even at 18, I knew my life is going to go quick, I'm going to die, and I'd rather live for eternity than live for time. For you that will be blessed to be with us after the tour, I'm going to talk on that uh, when we're up north. Time versus eternity, really interesting message that I have about that. But if it's true, it's true. And that's all that matters, because like I said, this life goes too quick to hold on to our pride and hold on to our, our, our cherished falsehoods. And actually says that in Jeremiah, that in that day, you know, that, that the false prophets are going to say, no, I'm not a prophet, I'm a farmer's boy. You know, and they're going to say, we inherited lies from our fathers. And unfortunately, I love my father, I love my grandfather, I love my family. They mean everything to me, but I inherited lies from them. You know, Catholicism, I don't find it in here. And that was one of the first things, you know, I'm growing up thinking Peter's the first pope. You know, and anybody, when I saw these evangelists, uh, Jimmy Swaggin, I would laugh. I'm like, how could anybody follow that? You know, you got to be pretty, pretty wild-eyed to follow that kind of stuff. And yet I'm thinking that the Catholic Church is where it's at. That every believer must be a Catholic or not. But as Yahweh's word came into me as I'm reading this, and I'm finding, wow, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. 
It's not meshing with what the Catholic Church is teaching me. There was just nothing that I could even correlate together. And then moving to Israel the last 14, 15 years, it's just blown my, my life away. Because you really start to see how many things we missed in our diaspora. And it's a blessing. You know, I don't take it, like I said, it's not all or nothing. Everything in life is a stepping stone. It's a stepping stone. You know, and every, every day of our life, every week, every year, we learn something more of that stepping stone. I had a friend of mine who was a Jehovah Witness. And when I showed him all the falsehoods, he agreed with me. But you know what he said? Well, I put 12 years into this. I don't know if I want to throw it all away. I said, man, this ain't a job. It's not like eight more years you get a gold watch. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Jehovah Witness have some truth. There's hardly any religion that everything is wrong. Even Catholicism has some truth. Everything is a stepping stone. So it doesn't matter where you started. What matters is where you're ending. And you want to keep going on that stepping stone. You want to keep getting truth because the day Yeshua returns and we're spirit, we'll have all truth. Until that day, none of us have all truth. You know, but we continue to learn. And that's why the Bible says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Master Yeshua and the Messiah. Because we're continually growing in that truth. So we have two wildernesses. You have your spiritual wilderness when you're coming out of a cultic pagan religion. You know, and for many people, same as myself, once you come out of your religion, you're in that wilderness. It's you and Yahweh. And he's teaching you and he's showing you. And, and face it, when you're in something for years, I mean, maybe even a leader in a church, it, it hurts. Your whole life is being thrown apart. So you need that spiritual wilderness. You need that time to pray and fast and really seek Yahweh's will in your life. But then there's a time to come out of the spiritual wilderness because you have to prepare. There's going to be a physical wilderness. And I say, our life can be summed up in the life of Moses. If you look at the life of Moses. Moses was 40 years in what? Egypt. Paganism, right? It's the same as where most of us started. It. Then what happens? He's 40 years in the wilderness, right? He's out there learning to be a shepherd. He was a king before, you know, the prince of Egypt. And now he's learning to be a shepherd. But then after those 40 years in the wilderness, where did he go? He went back to Egypt to get the other people out. So it's the same with us. We all have our wilderness to learn our walk, but there's a point where you have to go back to get more people out, because that's what it's based on, bearing fruit. So this is, this is where we're going, you know, this is where it's at. And the Bride of Messiah are the people that are doing that. They're the people that are learning it. They're the people that, that nothing is stopping them from going in the grace and truth of Yeshua Messiah. Isaiah 48, we'll see another scripture about the wilderness. Isaiah 48, in verse 20. It says, Go out of Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans. Tell this with the voice of rejoicing. Let this be heard. Let it go out to the end of the earth. Say, Yahweh has redeemed his son Jacob. This is end time stuff. And they did not thirst. He led them in the deserts. He made waters flow out of the rocks for them. And he cut open the rock and the water gushed out. Now again, you, you read it in context, clearly this is end time. Because Israel came out of Egypt, they didn't come out of Babylon. And this is an end time Babylon scripture. But he's saying at the end time, when you go in the wilderness, that there will be a physical wilderness again. But look what he says, they didn't thirst, he led them in the deserts, he made waters flow out of the rock for them. And I actually had the blessing twice, Moses hit the rock and water came out. One of them was over here in Israel, I saw that rock. I saw the rock that was split by the water. The other one is in Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, you didn't get to see that except on, on video. But Yahweh will do it again. He can do it. So we don't have to fear, you know, where are we going to get food and water? You know, what will we clothe? And what did Yeshua say when, when, when he said that? He said, those are what the pagans look for. Our Heavenly Father knows our needs. Seek ye first the kingdom of Yahweh, and all these things will be given to you. He's not going to bring us to the wilderness to kill us. The same way he didn't bring the Israelites to the wilderness to kill them. But after a while, once they started getting a little grumpy, what was their charge against Yahweh? You took us out of a land of milk and honey, talking about Egypt, to bring us to this wilderness to kill us. Can you imagine they're saying this to Yahweh? So again, I say, your life now, all of our life, right now, we're coming out of the paganism, we're on the spiritual wilderness, but the end of this will be a real wilderness. There will be. When the system falls apart, there'll be, you know... 42 months of a horrific time when the beast power is set up. And it will be all over the, the earth. You can read that in Jeremiah 25. It's going to start here in Israel. It will go to America, but it will come all over the earth. There will be nowhere to hide except Psalm 91. 
The only where to hide is in Yahweh in those days. But if you don't prepare today, you will never make it through it. You'll never make it through it. It'll be virtually impossible. That's why Jeremiah 50 and verse 28, look what he says to Babylon in the end time. Jeremiah 50, verse 28. The voice of those who flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of Yahweh or Elohim, the vengeance of the sanctuary. And what is the sanctuary of Yahweh today? John 3. I will tear down this sanctuary and I will rebuild it in three days. But he's talking about the sanctuary of his body. And Yahweh is so critically upset with Western society today, in particularly America, because of that false system of security that they put there, they're taking away the faith of the people. And the people don't understand the spiritual condition they're in. But let's go to it. Revelation 3. There are seven churches in Revelation. We've read about one. To the one, the bride of Messiah, the one who's being faithful. And again, these are spiritual conditions. You know, not necessarily uh, physical places, but spiritual conditions that people are in. And let's look at the overall spiritual condition of most people in the last generation. Revelation 3 and verse 14. And to the messenger of the congregation of Laodicea. Right, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the head of the creation of Yahweh. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold nor hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. And interesting, if you look at Laodicea, they were an extremely rich place. One of the richest places on earth. As a matter of fact, there was a gigantic earthquake there that destroyed everything. And they needed no outside help to build because they had all the resources. But there's one thing Laodicea did not have. Water. They didn't have water. So they would have to pump the water in to get in there. Now, if you look at it, both cold and hot water are good. There's hot springs, you know, all over Israel. And hot springs are very good medicinal. They're good if you, if you have aches and pains. They're good for healing, you know. They're good if you're taking a, a shower. You know, so hot water is, is profitable. And cold water. You know, if it's 100 degrees out there and you drink that nice cold water, it feels really good. But lukewarm water is good for nothing but inducing vomiting. So that's what it was. Laodicean had nothing. When they would pump the water in, that's what it was. It was lukewarm water that would simply be used for vomiting. Because you say, I am rich, and I am made rich, and I am in need of nothing. And do you not know you're miserable, and a wanderer, and poor, and blind, and naked? And unfortunately, I mean, many of you, you live in the West. I don't think you can deny that's the spiritual condition today with Western society. America, Europe, you know, the ones, the richest nations, that's what it is. And you know what? Try to give something to somebody who doesn't need anything. You know? Try to give something. There's people I know, very, very good people, that are givers, and they'll give and they'll help, but you try to give them anything. No, 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 I don't need it. And you know what? Every time you're giving, what does there have to be? A receiver. And sometimes you're a giver, and sometimes you're a receiver. And there's a blessing on both ends of it. If somebody, I learned the hard way, if, you, if somebody gave me a dress, I don't need a dress, I don't wear a dress. But I wouldn't take your blessing away by saying, no, don't give it to me. I would take the blessed dress and I'd seek somebody else that needs it. Because there's a blessing every time there's a giver, every time there's a taker. But when you're looking at the little to say it, you can't help them. They need nothing. And I've seen it there. You know, I've been asked to speak in places in the United States. And then people, you start to talk to them, and, and as you talk, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. And it's like, whoa, 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 slow down. <laughs> Let me get the word out and then tell me how much you know it before I say it. But that's the way sometimes people are. Rich and increased with goods in need of nothing. And like I said, you can't help a person that needs nothing. But yet, what does Yahweh say their spiritual condition really is? They're really miserable and wanderers and poor and blind and naked. Like I said, they're not planted. They're not planted. You see nowhere ever in the New Testament where you see, you know, you hear the wandering Jew. You know, it's a plant, the wandering Jew. You know, there's different things with that. But today you see the wandering believer. You know, they float from place to place. And they float from place to place. And like I said, there's a time you're in the wilderness that you can float. But the point comes that you need to get planted somewhere. You need to be planted, because how can you be involved in the work of Yahweh if you're not planted? If you're just wandering and wandering and wandering. And believe me, the kingdom is not about wanderers. But they're miserable. They're wanderers, they're poor, they're blind, and they're naked. Why are they naked? Because they have no covering. 
You know, like I said, all over the world, all over the Bible, judicial order is everywhere. I mean, it's the most basic, simple thing, and we can understand it on a civil level. Would you go and live in a city that had no fire department, that had no policemen, that's a wild, wild west, you know, you got to worry about people coming in at night and shooting you down? Of course not. But yet somehow when it comes within congregational structure now, you know, judicial order, oh, I don't want to hear it. And that's why they're naked, because they're naked because they have no covering. And the Bible always has a covering. And a covering is a blessing. It's not a curse. You know, read Numbers 30. A woman, what a blessing every woman and wife has. That you could say the most ridiculous thing and your husband can nullify it. I don't have that blessing. It doesn't say that with the man. So if I say something ridiculous and it comes out of my mouth, I have to perform it. Oh, paint your house seven times? Oh, well, I guess so. <laughs> but at least with a woman, it says that the man can annul the vow. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. You know, when I came into a congregation, there was a thousand people in that congregation. And as a new believer, 18 years old, knowing nothing, coming out of Catholicism, I was so thankful to Yahweh that I had leaders that I trusted, that, that I was learning there, that I had brethren that, that were mature in the faith, and I felt so secure having so many believers. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to have a covering. It's not a curse. Yet, for the Laodicean, they don't need it. They don't need it because they have every single thing. But what does he say? I advise you to buy from me gold, having been fired by fire, that you may be rich in white garments, as we're going to read in Revelation 19, that you may be clothed and your shame and your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye slab that you may see. I, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous then and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens at the door, I will enter to him and I will dine with him, he and me. The one overcoming... That's what it is in the end. It's about overcoming and enduring to the end. The one overcoming, I will give to him to sit with me in my throne as I overcame and sat with my father in his throne. To the one who has an ear, hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. So we never want to get to that point where we don't have ears to hear. And you never know where Yahweh can speak through. It's not just with teachers and pastors. There's times sometimes where Yahweh will, you'll be praying about something. You can be in a butcher shop. And something will come out of that butcher's mouth, and that's the word that Yahweh was giving to you, that you were asking for. You just have to be attentive. You have to have ears to hear. And you never know where it's coming from. You don't know. But if you block yourself off, if you think you have all knowledge, if you think I got everything, you're never going to get anywhere. You're going to be one of these people. And this is scary. It's scary to me. I hope it's scary to you. Because I never want to feel that I can fall into this category, where I'm at a point where I think I know everything and I won't listen to anything. Because that's the worst place to be in. You don't want to be a Laodicean in the end time. So we see this though. It, 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 you know, it's important because so many in this world today have fallen into the Laodicean spirit. And we want to check ourselves. 1 John 2 and verse 15. 1 John 2 and verse 15. 1 John 2 and verse It says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that which is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust thereof. But the one doing the will of Elohim abides forever. So I think you could see with the Laodicean, all of this love of the world comes into it. You know, the whole Babylonian system of money, you know, the, 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 the trusting in the riches more than the faith in Yahweh. You know, and it's the system too. The system was created to make it that way. You know, to make you have to trust in them for money, for health care, for anything. And yet if you show faith in Yahweh, even today now, you know, uh, there's stories of somebody who didn't take their child to a doctor because they were showing faith and they wound up having their children taken away from them. So the system is geared, Satan is gearing it that way, to, to take away your faith. And you have to be aware of it and you have to fight against it. Because we see here... If, you, if, if the love of the world is in you, the love of the Father is not in you. If you go back to Genesis 3, 6, it's really interesting when you equate Eve's sin with this scripture. Genesis 3, 6. And the woman saw that the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. And she took of the fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her and ate. So let's look at these two scriptures. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, Genesis 3, 6. First it said, 1 John 2, 15 says, the lust of the flesh, right? 
Genesis 3, 6 says, good for food. The lust of the flesh, good for food. And then the lust of the eyes, it was pleasant to the eyes. And the pride of life, 1 John 2, with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree was desired to make one wise. So you have lust of flesh, good for food, lust of eyes, pleasant to the eyes, pride of life, tree to be desired to make one wise. You see the same problem here. It was the same temptation that comes. That if you allow the Laodicean spirit to overcome you, and you're, you're, you're filled with, with the, the, the love of the world and the lust of the world, you're never going to be the bride of Messiah. Because what you're going to see is the bride of Messiah is totally opposite this. It's a totally 100% different function. Many are called fewer chosen. Let's go back to Revelation 7. I already went over this last week, so I won't do this much or the other day, but I will just go over the scripture one more time, just showing the two groups. Revelation 7. Starting in verse 2. And I saw another cherub coming up from the rising of the sun, having a seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a great voice to the four cherubs, to whom it was given to them to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until the seal, until we seal the servants of our Elohim on their foreheads. So we have the mark of the beast, we have the seal of Yahweh. And I heard the number of those having been sealed, 144,000, having been sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then he goes on. Reuben, Judah, Gad, Asher, all the way down. Simeon, Levi, Zebulon. So we see the 144,000, clearly 12,000 from each tribe. Then go down to verse 14. And I said to him, Sir, you know who these are, the great multitude. These are those coming out of great affliction, and they wash their robes and wipe them in the blood of the Lamb. So clearly there's two groups of people in the end time. There's the 144,000, the inner bride of Messiah, you know, the ones that are purified, and then there's the great multitude, the ones that will be purified through tribulation. So now let's start going into the characteristics of the 144,000. Revelation 14. But we see that they go into the wilderness. We'll read a little bit toward the end. They'll also come out of the wilderness. Revelation 14. <laughs> And I saw and behold the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000. Just read about in Revelation 7. With the name of his Father having been written on their foreheads. You know, and a lot of times people say, how important is the name of Yahweh? Well, it's pretty important here. It's pretty important here. Because we just saw it to the Philadelphian, they haven't denied his name. And then we see here the name of Yahweh is in their foreheads. So when people tell me, well, it's not important or this and that, that's fine, I'm not going to convince you, but many of you are chosen. I don't know. To me, it's just illogical when something is written 7,000 times, how you can deny it. You know, like I said, it's just like me coming up to you and saying, your name's not rolling. You look like a friend. I don't care. I'm going to call you friend. It just, it just doesn't make sense. So when the Creator says in Genesis 3, uh, Exodus 3.15, like Clifford said, you know, this is my name. My name is Yahweh. This is my name for all generations and my memorial forever. Why would we deny it? What would be the reason we can deny it? You know, and like I said, if, if I came up here and I prayed in the name of Allah, no one's going to say amen. If I pray in the name of Baal or Vishnu, but if I pray in the name of, of, of God, the Babylonian deity, because we're used to it, because we grew up with it, then all of a sudden it's okay. But like I said, I grew up 18 years with Catholicism, and I knew that the things I learned there were not correct, so I had to get rid of them. It's the choice we make. It's the choice we make. Many are called, few are chosen. And it's the choice you have to make. You have to look in the Bible, and you have to see what is true, and you have to cherish it. And that's part of the Bride of Messiah, as we see here. Because, listen to verse 2 and 3. And I heard a sound of heaven, as the sound of many waters, and the sound of great thunder. Also I heard a sound of harpers harping on their harps. And they sing as a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to learn the song except the 144,000, those having been redeemed from the earth. And I say, wow, wouldn't it be great if all of a sudden... That song starts coming out of your mouth. <laughs> you know you're doing something right. These are the ones who, who had not become defiled, for they are pure. They're holy. These are the ones following the Lamb wherever He may go. These were redeemed from among man, being the first fruits to Yahweh and to the Lamb. And no decoy was found in their mouth, for they are unmarked before the throne of God. They have no decoy. They have no falsehood. You know, what Yeshua says, that's what they're doing. Just like the, the one in... in uh, the Philadelphian. 
they follow the land wherever he goes. The word of Yahweh is in their mouth. And like it says in Deuteronomy 30, you know, it's not across the waters that you have to swim for it. It's not up in heaven that we have to take a spaceship. It's right here. And most of it is so simple it, that it's unbelievable. Like I said, the Ten Commandments, the greatest scholars, religious scholars of our time, the ones that have all these letters after their name, they can't count to ten. There's only ten commandments. And like I said, if you took this Bible and put somebody on a desert island all by himself with nothing but a Bible, and after 30 years went for him, you, it's impossible to come up with in this Bible that the Ten Commandments are done away with or the Sabbath was changed to Sunday. It's not there. I've had this debate over and over and over with, with every kind of leader you can imagine on the Sabbath day. And I've stood there, and they've actually, it, it, was, it was a joke. They were laughed at because there is nothing, not one scripture in the New Testament there could be one or two that were mistranslated, uh, uh, and I had the original documents to show them where it was mistranslated. You know, like Romans 10, 4. Messiah is the goal of the law, not the end of the law. That's in the Greek and in the Aramaic. And they would look like a fool because they would get up there debating this issue, and they had no proof whatsoever except their tradition. You know, the same way I had my tradition coming from Catholicism. But when I realized that my tradition was coming from a Roman emperor from the 3rd century, I really didn't want that tradition. And like I said, I love my family, you know. Today, they're still very much into it. But it's not my tradition anymore. Because I want to follow the word. And 30 years later, I'm still growing. I'm still learning. But we see here, no decoy was found in their mouth. And they follow the lamb wherever he goes. If you have ears to hear, believe me, Yahweh will show you the truth. He will. It's not going to be all at once. You know, it happens in stages, but he will. If you have ears to hear, it is such a beautiful life to live as a believer. Because everywhere you go, everything you read, every day you open your Bible, there's something else to learn. All you need to do is pray to him every day for that. You know, Father, before you, you study every day, ask him, Father, show me your word. Show me your truth. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. Matthew 19. Let's look at something else about this elect group. And again, regardless of if we're in that group, we should all be aspiring to at least be the best we could. Matthew 19 and verse 16. And behold, coming near, one said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Yahweh. But if you desire to enter into life, keep the commandments. <laughs> there it is again, all over the new Testament. He said to him, which ones? And he said, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. No doubt, these are the Ten Commandments. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Yeshua said to him, if you desire to be perfect, go sell your property and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But having heard the word, being grieved, the young man went away, for he had many possessions. Kingdom principles. I teach a whole course at the Bible school on kingdom principles. If you don't understand what a kingdom is, how can you enter the kingdom of Yahweh? You have to understand what a kingdom is. And in kingdom principles, there's no private ownership of property. In a kingdom, the king owns everything. See, we come from a society in the West that we were a rebellion to a kingdom. That's the way our country started in the United States. We rebelled against the king and started something, you know, called the United States of America, right? And look at our constitution that we say is so great. How does it begin? We the people. We the people. What does Yahweh's word say? I, Yahweh, thus say this. There's no we the people in the kingdom. If you have a mentality of we the people, you're going to be you the outside. <laughs> it doesn't have we the people. That's not a kingdom mentality. And a kingdom mentality, and like I said, a real kingdom is real land. It's the king's domain. The king owns it. But the king owns everything in a kingdom. And do you know that in a kingdom, if there's even one poor person, who's it the reflection of? The king. The king, because in his kingdom, nobody is poor. And that's why Yeshua tells us, what is our main job in Matthew 25? When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was poor, you know, you, you or naked, you gave me clothes. When, Master, when did we do it? When you did it to the least of my brethren, the least of the ones of my kingdom, you did it to me. Because if somebody is an ambassador for my kingdom, and he's hungry, who's the reflection on? 
Because who's our faith in? Our faith is in him. And what are they going to say? Wow, he's an ambassador. He doesn't even have food. So it's our blessing that we can bless others. So now, does that mean we have to take everything we own and sell it tomorrow and give it away? Of course not, because then all of us would be dependent. We would all be like that. You know, we would become a liability instead of an asset. No. What it means is Psalm 24. The earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof, the people that those that live in it. So everything belongs to him. If you look at this podium, it's made from wood that he owns the tree. The floor is made from tile from stone that comes from his rock. He owns everything. So now that he owns everything, including us, he puts things in our hands. He can put a vehicle, he can put money, he can put a house. But he says, seek ye first the kingdom. So we don't have to feel ashamed that we've been blessed, but take those blessings and use them for the kingdom. Use them to bless others. And that's why I say, United States of America, they had to do something right that Yahweh made them his banker. He said, I trust these people. Because again, you need physical money to, to feed people and do these things. So he said, hmm, who can we trust? We're going to trust these people. They're good people. But what's happened in the Laodicean era? That the people now are hoarding it to themselves, and they're the new world order system of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And it's not being used for the kingdom. How long do you keep it? As long as you need it. I got a man. I need it. The day I don't need it anymore, give it to somebody else. Because it wasn't mine to begin with. It's Yahweh's. So when he blesses you with something, you don't have to feel bad, but use it for the kingdom. Years ago, I met a man. They were having a 25th church anniversary of one of the churches. And this guy was retired. Older man, like 70-something years old. He said, I'm so excited. He said, I was blessed this week. We got a brand new car. He got a brand new car. He was a single man living by himself. And it's a big station wagon. I'm like, what are you going to do with a station wagon? He said, now I can go pick up four widows every week and drive them to the congregation. No blessing that's put in your hand is for you. And it really is. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And every one of you know it. That it's much greater when someone really needs something and you can give it to them and you see the joy on their faces than when you get something yourself. And that's why I say there's a time to give, there's a time to receive. But everything belongs to him. So what a blessing it is when he puts it in our hand and we have the opportunity to put it in somebody else's hand. And that's what the good news message is. He's giving this message in our hand and it's for us to bring it to other people and bear more fruit for the kingdom. So this is, this is what it's about. This is part of this kingdom principle that the bride of Messiah is doing. That they're not ashamed because Yahweh does bless people. Abraham had much wealth. It's not about being a monk of the 6th century and putting chains on our back. It's about whatever he blesses us with, we use it as a blessing for others in his kingdom. Luke 14. Luke 14, another important principle of the Bride of Messiah. Luke 14 and verse 25. He says, And great crowds came together to him, and turning he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not love less than me, his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers and sisters, and beside even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Oh, that's a hard one. We have a whole course on discipleship. Most people don't even understand what a disciple is. And I say, if you look in the New Testament, the word Christian is used three times. The word believer is used four times. The word disciple is used more than 250 times. And most people don't even know what a disciple is. A disciple, limud in the Hebrew, comes from learned one, taught one. You know, a disciple is like a groupie. Whatever the master does, he's doing the same thing. And he clearly says, though, that if you put father, mother, sister, brother, or even your own life before him, you cannot be his disciple. For who of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has the things to finish, that having laid a foundation, not having strength to finish, all those seen begin to mock. Saying, this man began to build and did not have strength to finish. Or what king going to attack another king in war does not first sit down and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet those coming upon him with 20,000. But if not, he being still far off, sending a delegation, he asks the things for peace. So that every one of you who does not forsake all his possessions is not able to be my disciple. And like I said, what does it mean? It doesn't mean literally or it could, depending. But what it means is, there's nothing in your mind that your thinking is yours. It's about using, not possessing, as we're going to see a little later. 
So there's nothing in your mind. Not, that's my house. You know, I worked for 25 years and I earned it and I deserve it. You know, we all hear that. That's the big lingo. You know, that, hey, I earned it and I deserve it. He say, no, no. You have to forsake it in here before you can forsake it in here. Because, again, we're all going to have something. We're not going to run around naked. It's not the Garden of Eden yet. It will be. But there's nothing that you possess in your possession that should be so great that you're not willing to give up. And that's what he's saying. Unless you're willing to forsake all, including people, you cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes bland with, what will it be seasoned? It is not fit for soil, nor for manure. They throw it out. This one having ears to hear, men of hear. So this is part of the Bride of Messiah. These are people that literally are living this way. That they're living this way, that they may have blessings, you may see the blessings in their life, but whatever blessing they have, they're using those blessings for the kingdom of Yahweh. And that's what he said. He didn't say you can't have them. He just said, seek the kingdom first, and all the rest will be given to you. He'll give it to you. He'll pour it out upon you. 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. We had this yesterday on our certificate. Or do you not know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit in you, which you have from Elohim, and you're not of yourself? You were bought with a price, then glorify Elohim in your body and in your spirit, which belong to Elohim. Do we realize that? Like I said, remember, you know, Western society, we're, we're, we're taught more to be kings than servants. You know, and that's why we build our own little kingdoms, and we put fences around our kingdoms, you know, and, and, and we build it up there. But literally, he says here, that do you know that you were bought with a price? And a great price, you know, you know it now. You were there in the house of Caiaphas. You know, you've seen the price that had to be paid. Therefore, glorify Elohim in your body and your spirit, which belong to Elohim. The bride of Messiah knows who they belong to. They know they are a slave of Messiah, and his goals are their goals. His goals are their goals. John 12, in verse 24. John 12 and verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you that a grain of wheat, except it should fall and die on the ground, remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his soul will destroy it. And whoever hates his soul in this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Who are the ones who are protected in the end time in Ezekiel 9? The ones who are sighing and crying to the abominations done in the earth. You know, you'll talk to people out there and sometimes people say, yeah, you know, it's really not that bad. It's really not that bad. You know, but even if it's not bad in my life, you know, my life has been pretty good. I didn't have a bad life. It doesn't change the life of our brother in Ethiopia, our brother in Sudan, our brother in India, you know, our brother in the Philippines. So you got to look at the big picture. Are we sighing and crying? You wouldn't believe the abominations going on in this world. You know, turn on your TV, look what's happening in Syria. What people are doing to their own children, butchering them. You just can't believe the horrors that are going on. So the fact that you've been blessed that you're not living in those horrors, I mean, thank Yahweh. But still sigh and cry for the other people around the earth. Because we're one body. When one suffers, we all suffer. When one glorifies, we all glorify together. And it should affect us that our brothers and sisters, parts of the very body of Messiah, are suffering unbelievable. Are we sighing and crying? Because that's what the Bride of Messiah is doing. They're sighing and crying for the things happening in the earth. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Verse 22. We see the marriage covenant is actually a template of the Eternal marriage covenant of Yeshua and his bride. Uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to our master. Because the husband is the head of the wife, as also Messiah is the head of the congregation, and he is the savior of the body. But even as the congregation is subject to Messiah, so also the wives to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Messiah also loved the congregation and gave himself up on his behalf. 
that he might sanctify it, cleansing it with the washing of water in the word, that he might present it to himself as the glorious congregation, not having stain or wrinkle or any such things, but that it be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He loving his wife loves himself. For then no one hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even also as our master does to the congregation. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this a man shall leave his father and mother, and will be joined to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. God united. This is a great mystery, but I speak as to Messiah and his congregation. Nevertheless, let every one of you so love his wife as himself, and the wife that she give reference to the husband. So we really see the purpose of the marriage covenant. So whether you're a single person and not even married, and you have to stay a chaste bride for him, or you're a married person, and you're trying to fulfill this, this is the whole reason he made marriage. He made the marriage covenant so we can understand our eternal relationship with him and our wedding to him. Genesis 3.16. Now again, collectively, all of us are playing the part of the bride. Yeshua is the bridegroom. Collectively, we will be the bride. Like we said, one form or another, we might be a bridesmaid, we might be a guest, but somehow all of us are part of the same group, the same family. Different position, but part of the same family. Genesis 3.16. And he said to the woman, I will greatly increase your sorrow and your conception. I think we're all seeing that in this world as the birth pains are taking place to the kingdom. You shall bear sons in sorrow, and your desire will be toward your husband, and he will rule over you. So again, the bride and Messiah, remember, they follow Yeshua wherever he goes. They follow, they follow Yeshua wherever he goes. They don't have their own life. They don't have their own goals. They don't have, you know, like today in society, the man goes here, the woman goes here. You know, when you see each other for maybe 20 minutes at the end of the day. The bride and Messiah, their goals are Yeshua's goals. You know, you look at the priest in the Old Covenant. The priest could not own land. The priest could not work. Why? Because Yahweh was their possession. And they had one job. One job was to do what? To take care of the sanctuary of Yahweh. And now here we are of a higher order. We're not Levites. We're of the higher order of Melchizedek. You know? It's, it's the reality of that sinking through, the responsibility that comes with it. You know, we're commanded to bear fruit. John 15. If you don't bear fruit, what's going to happen? You're going to be cut down and withered away. You know that he's coming back, the parable of the talents. Each one was given, one five, one two, one one, according to their ability. We're not all to bear the same because we all have different abilities. But we all have to bear something. We have to bear something. He didn't call us as one of five million people out there. And this time we're living in just to go out and have parties in Hawaii and have a great life. That's not the reason he called us. He called us to bear fruit. He called us to have the same goal that he has. And that's why it says they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. His goals are their goals. John 17, John 17 and verse 16. Another important characteristic of the Bride of Messiah. John 17 and verse 16. He says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Remember what we read in the beginning? If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So the bride of Messiah, his people, they're not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. They follow the word wherever it goes, because he is the living word, Yeshua. As you sent them into the world, I have also sent them into the world. So we're in the world, but not of the world. And I fear for their sakes. I sanctify myself so that they may also be sanctified by truth. It's the truth that sets us apart from the world. And I do not pray concerning these only, but also concerning those who will believe in me through their word. And here we are today. Somebody sacrificed somebody's life. You know, the martyrs that went so we can be here today with these cherish, cherish, cherish truths. That all may be ikad, united as one. As you are in me, Father, and I in you that they also may be ikad in us, united in us. That the world may believe that you sent me, and I have given them the glory which you have given me, that they may be ikad, united, as we are ikad, united. I in them, and you in me, and that they may be perfected in one. 
and that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. So again, there's a perfect unity here. There's no strife, there's no contention, and why? Because the bride of Messiah is 100% surrendering their will to Yeshua. Remember Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 39. When he say, Father, if there's any other way, but not my will be done, your will be done. It's a total surrender. And like I said, it doesn't just come. Because in our society today, especially in Western society, you know, number one, we have our human nature, which human nature is not surrender. But in Western society, everything we're bred with from birth is not to surrender. Girls grow up, and what do the parents want them to do? Go get a good education. Go to college. Because you're going to marry some jerk, and he's going to leave you, and you've got to take care of yourself. Totally against the marriage covenant of Yahweh. Nothing is there towards surrendering. Who, who surrenders? Weak people surrender, right? I'm not going to surrender, because if I surrender, I'll be a fool. I'll have nothing to protect myself. It's not the Bride of Messiah. The Bride of Messiah completely surrenders. You know why? Because they have the faith to know that Yahweh will take care of them. That Yeshua will take care of them. They don't have to take care of themselves. And without a complete surrender, you will not be in His kingdom. You must surrender your will. That's what it's about. Because you want to know something? There is no such thing as freedom. It's the biggest lie that's ever told in the West. You know, there is no such thing as freedom. Because we don't have the ability to give ourselves life. And how can you have freedom without life? If Yahweh takes his breath away, we're dead in a couple of minutes. There is no freedom. What you have is free choice. You have the choice to choose to serve Satan or choose to serve Yahweh. And Satan is the world. You've got the world or you got Yahweh. That's your choice. And Yahweh gives us that choice. But never think you have freedom. Because once you start thinking you have freedom, you've made yourself your own Elohim. Only an Elohim has freedom because an Elohim can take life like Yeshua said. I put my life down, I take it up again. And none of us have that ability. None of us do. But praise Yahweh, He does give us the ability to choose freedom of choice. And each of us can choose life or death. Like He says in Deuteronomy 30, I put before you life and death. Choose life. The Bride of Messiah chooses life. The Bride of Messiah follows Yeshua wherever he goes. They're ikad, they're united. And if you're not united with your brother and sister sitting next to you, you're not united with him. I've heard people come up to me. They don't want to, they don't want to fellowship in any congregation. It's between me and Yahweh. But let me tell you, the kingdom is much better than you and Yahweh. The bride is collective. And unless we can get along together, unless there's that unity between us, how will we ever have it with him? That's what John says, right? How can you love Yahweh who you haven't seen if you can't love your brother who you have seen? And we'll see that's another major characteristic. Let's go to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, let's see a little bit also. Because you want to know something, it is the greatest unbelievable miracle that Yahweh gives us. That He transforms us from who we are into who He wants us to be. And to me, there's no greater proof that this Bible is true than the transformation of the soul. Because when people ask me, sure, I can give you a hundred different reasons, I can prove to you why there's creation, not evolution, but the greatest way I can prove to somebody that this Bible is right is myself. Because I know where I came from. I know I was an evil, selfish, corrupted person, and I know I couldn't have changed my human nature without His Spirit. And that should be the testimony of each of us. That's the testimony that we could show. You know, that Yahweh has transformed us into something that's not even human. You know, lo lo love your neighbor. Some do, some don't. Love your enemy. It's not human. But it is heavenly. With the spirit of Yahweh, you can do it. You know, there's stories of uh, Richard Wormbrandt. You've probably heard of him. You know, Jewish man who was in concentration camps during uh, World War II. And his wife, his wife's parents were murdered by Nazis. And years later, a Nazi guard, the one who killed his parents, they saw. And what did she do? She cried and hugged the man and said, I forgive you, I forgive you. It's not humanly possible. And that man came to faith because of that. Because he couldn't imagine, why would you forgive me? Because the spirit of Messiah was in her. That's the only way. We can't humanly do it on our own. But the Spirit of Messiah can do it. Colossians 3. 
If then you were raised with Messiah, seek the things above where Messiah is sitting at the right hand of Yahweh. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died and your life has been hidden with Messiah in Elohim. Whenever Messiah our life is revealed, then also you will be revealed with him in glory. Then put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil lust, covetedness, for these are idolatry, on account of which things the wrath of Yahweh is coming on the deeds of disobedience, among whom you also walked at one time when you were living in these. But now you also put off all these things, wrath, anger, malice, evil speaking, filthy conversation out of your mouth. Do not lie one to another, having put off the old man with his practices. And put on the new life which is renewed in knowledge after the pattern in which it was originally created. We're going back to Eden. Where there is neither Jew nor Aramaean, circumcision or uncircumcision, foreign or Scythian, slave or free man, but Messiah is all and in all men. Therefore, as the elect of Yahweh, holy and beloved, put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one yourselves. If anyone has a complaint against any, even as Messiah forgave you, so also you should forgive them. And above all these, have love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Messiah rule in your hearts. For that goal you are called in one body. And be thankful to Messiah. Let the word of Messiah dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and exhorting yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to Elohim. And everything, whatever you do in word or in work, do all things in the name of our Master Yeshua, giving thanks to Yahweh the Father through Him. That's the Bride of Messiah summed up in 17 little verses there. You can't live in the world, work in the world, have all worldly friends, and put on holiness. It's impossible. You can't covet every dress that comes out in the store, or every new pair of shoes that comes out and put on holiness. You can't watch endless hours of TV with soap operas cursing, sex and violence and be holy. It's that simple. You can't do it. You can't do it. If you are, you're kidding yourself. And you know the word hypocrite. You know where that word comes from. It's a Greek word. It means actor. That's what a hypocrite is. Because an actor goes up and plays a part, but it's not really him. And that's why when you come with your Sabbath face and you're playing a part for a couple hours on the Sabbath and then you go back for six days and you're doing all these things, <laughs> then you're a hypocrite. There's nothing to it. You can't have self-centered, gossiping, sarcastic lives and put on holiness. It's that simple. You know the tongue. Wow, what an evil the tongue is. Let every word be for edifying. Think, think how much edification words can be and how much destruction words can be. Again, many believers, you know, gossip, gossip, gossip. Can't do it if you want to be the bride of Messiah. Holiness is a mindset. It's not just an action. The action is the outward sign of the mindset. But it's a mindset. And that's why you could have two people, and they could both be telling the same story, but then you get two diametrically opposite pictures of it because of the mindset. And if your mindset is with holiness, you won't be like that. Proverbs 20 and verse 8 says, A king who sits on the throne of judgment does not look upon any evil with his eyes. He does not look upon any evil with his eyes. How much evil do we look upon? Never in the, in the history of man has there been a time where you don't even have to leave your front door. All you have to do is turn on your TV, turn on your computer, and there's every form of wickedness that's there. Don't look upon the evil. Don't look upon the evil. I tell this story, you know, years ago, when I was a believer, I told you I came in very young as a believer, and I had my own business, I worked hard, and every Sunday I used to love to watch football, you know, NFL, National Football League. And I did, I used to say, hey, I'm working hard, I'm a single guy, I'm not bothering anybody, you know, work for six days, you know, keep the Sabbath, do everything, but on Sunday I just like to go in there and watch football. And I used to always rationalize it. Is, there, is it a sin? Show me, show me in the Bible, show me, show me, uh, you know, first uh, NFL 2 where it says, you shall not watch football. You can't find it, right? It's not a sin. But then all of a sudden at prayer, Yahweh hit me. And he said, don't ask if it's sin, ask if it's holy. That hit me like a ton of bricks. Because sure, we could do that with a lot of things. I've even talking to people about smoking. Where does it ever say in the Bible you can't smoke? 
You know, where is it saying in the Bible you can't do this? And, and the wickedness we have in this day and age, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that it doesn't say. But the principle is always there. Your body is the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. You know, why would I make a chimney out of it? But again, you don't want to ask the question, is it sin? You want to ask the question, is it holy? And when I asked that question, I got a total different answer. And I'm telling you, from the time I was this big, sports was my life. They trained me. I had scholarships. I got all kinds of trophies. I mean, everything. And I used to always think in my 20s, well, when I get old and I can't play anymore, I'm going to be in trouble. I thought, midlife crisis, forget about it. But I laid it at the feet of Yahweh. Ever since that time, I never had a desire. Because I said to him, make your desires my desires. And all of a sudden, I looked at that screen and I saw these big ugly guys smacking each other. And I said, what am I doing? This is so ridiculous. And, and there's no profit to it, you know? Because even if your team wins, they do the same thing all over again. There's no lasting feeling that comes by watching the game, even if they win. And Yahweh took it away. But you have to ask yourself that, what you're doing. Don't just ask, is it sin? Ask if it's holy. Ask if it's holy. Ask if something is set apart to Yahweh. Let's go to uh, Haggai, the second chapter. Haggai 2 and verse 12. It says, Behold, one bears holy flesh in the wing of his garment and touches his wing to the bread or boiled food or wine or oil or any food. Will it become holy? And the priest answered and said, No. So here it is. If you have something in your garment, some kind of food, and, you, and, and it's holy food, it's set apart food, and you touch something that's not set apart, will the holy with you make that holy? No, of course not. But then look at this. And Haggai said, if the unclean of body touches these, is it unclean? And the priest answered and said, it is. And Haggai answered and said, so is this people and so is this nation before me, declares Yahweh. And so is every work of their hands and that which they offer to me is unclean. So here it is. If you have something that's holy and the spirit of Yahweh is holy within you, you can't touch the profane and think you're going to make it holy. But when you touch the profane, your holiness will be profaned. And that's why I say it's an important question, not just if it's sin, but is it holy? You know, I've had people tell me everything from going to nude beaches to sitting in bars. That they're, they're converting these people, you know. We're converting them. We're going to convert them. No, it's not, it's not our job to go into sinful situations thinking that, you know, we're going to convert these people. It just is not our job. The clean cannot touch the unclean. The clean cannot touch the unclean. You know, clearly it says in, in Scripture, freely you receive, freely you give. You're not to sell the word of Yahweh. Clearly it says in Scripture, if they speak not according to the Torah and the testimony, there's no light in them. And constantly people will come up and ask me, what do you think of this? What do you think of this person? I might never, never heard of them. Who are they? And again, they're not preaching according to the Torah, and they're selling the word of Yahweh. You have your answer. It's not as hard as you make it out to be. You know, because for me, I'm going to stick on the same line. It doesn't make a difference. If you're selling the word of Yahweh, you are pros prostituting his word. It's very simple. You don't sell the word. You know, Isaiah 55, ho, ho, come those who will thirst, buy without money. You know, to the apostles, freely you receive, freely you give. So it's, 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 it, it, it doesn't change, you know, the word doesn't change. And even the ten virgins, like I said, the five who were not putting oil in their lamps, what happens when they go out to buy from these prostitutors, from these merchants, what happens? The bridegroom comes and they get locked out. You want to be filling your lamps with oil from this, from the word of Yahweh. That's where you want to be filling your, your, your lamps, so that when the bridegroom comes, your lamps are filled. They're bright. You know, because remember the wedding ceremony. Once they make their wedding covenant, the man would go off for a year. He'd go build the house and get all ready. And they never knew when he was returning. They knew the time, but not the exact date. And as he would come into the town, the bride would have a bright burning torch outside her house, so he would know where she was. And then they would yell, the bridegroom cometh, the bridegroom cometh. And that's the ten virgins. You know, five, their lights were going out. The love for the Messiah, the love that, 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 that should be burning in every one of us as we get closer to his return was waning. 
and we don't want it to happen. So again, you can't mix. You can't mix the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can't have a mixture. Syncretism. That's exactly how Catholicism started. That's what Constantine did. He took the paganism and he took some of the truth and he synchronized them together. You know, a mixture. A mixture which he always hates. He doesn't like it. The other thing is what we read here in Colossians 1. The fruits of the Spirit. The bride of Messiah will be not only having the fruits, they're exhibited. You can't have those fruits and people not know about it. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, faith. You can't have them. Mercy, you can't have them and be hiding them inside of you. It's impossible. So one way to know how much the Holy Spirit is working in your life is how do you have those fruits? You know, how do you have those fruits? Like I said, anger. Anger is not one of them. Anger is one of the fruits of the flesh. And when you look at it, 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 anger is an uncontrolled spirit. It's no different than a demon. There's nothing that makes people more uncomfortable when there's somebody that can just blow up and be angry and you not know what they're going to do. And if you have that, you've got to work with it. You've got to allow the spirit of Yahweh to kill the spirit of anger. John 13, 34 and 35. What is the most? All men will know you're my disciples by this, your love one for another. So again, you know what? We could sit here with all the, 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 the smart words and we could have the right doctrine and we could tell these things of uh, whatever. They really make no difference if you don't have love for one for another. Knowledge is not going to bring you into his kingdom. Knowledge is not going to make you the bride of Messiah. Because you know something? Knowledge can be given instantaneously. You know? Yeshua can come back and with the blink of an eye, he can give you all knowledge of everything. But character is something that does not come by instantaneous fiat. That's why this whole 6,000 year plan is here. Because character is something you have to grow into. Remember in Genesis, you know, he says, let's make man after our image and our likeness. We know we're in his image, right? He has eyes, he has hair, he has hands. But his likeness you have to grow into. His likeness is his character. And it doesn't happen overnight. You grow into it. And how do you grow into it? By not reviling back when someone reviles at you. You know, by not answering harshly when somebody comes at you. By, like I said, even showing love to your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. And showing that there's a different spirit in you than in the world. Because there is. Not just a different one, but a stronger one. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Start in verse 5, and a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our Elohim, all his servants, and the ones fearing him, small and great. And I heard as the sound of a numerous crowd, and the sound of many waters, and the sound of strong thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because Yahweh Elohim Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and let us exalt, and we will give glory to him, because the marriage of the Lamb came, and his wife prepared herself. And it was given to her that she might be clothed in fine linen. Pure and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said to me, Right, blessed are the ones having been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These words of Yahweh are true. And here we are, we're living in those days. This is the days that we need to be purifying ourselves. We need to be coming out of the world. We need to get serious. Because I'll tell you something, it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. The nature that's in us, the world that's around us, Satan's pull, it will not just happen. You have to fight it every day of your life. You have to fight it every day of your life. And if you don't, I'm telling you, what happens? You'll become a Laodicean. You'll sit there thinking because, wow, I know this knowledge, or I don't eat that kind of meat. I'm set. And that's not going to get you into the kingdom of Yahweh. It's certainly not going to make you the bride of Messiah. What's going to make you the bride of Messiah is fighting yourself every single day. Because like they said, I found the enemy, and the enemy is me. That's what it's about. You know, I'm not going to blame my teacher when I was in third grade. I'm not going to blame my parents. I'm not going to blame my wife. I'm not going to blame the, the sister downstairs, the nun. No, it's me. It's me. I have to fight me. Because each of us only knows the enemy that's within each of us. And yet, if we yield, if we surrender that enemy, then Yeshua will lift you up. The bride, every spot and wrinkle comes out, and she makes herself ready. But you have to work on it. You've got to work on it. Day in and day out. Let's quickly go to Song of Solomon. Because I want to show you Song of Solomon, which is a beautiful book. 
about the bride and the bridegroom. And just beautiful things to look at the love that Yeshua has for his bride. Let me read some of it. I'm going to go to Song of Solomon 4. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are as doves from behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats which lie down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep which come up from the washing place, of which they all are bearing twins, and a bereaved one is not among them. Showing there's fruit that's being born. Not just fruit, but twins. You know, there's multiple fruit to his bride. Your lips are like a cord of scarlet, and your speech is becoming. Your temples are like a piece of pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like a tower of David, built as an armory. A thousand bucklers hang on it, and all the shields of the mighty end. What is that showing? Security. There is no, there is no uh, second thoughts. There is no inhibition. There is no doubt that his bride is secure in who they are. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, feeding among the lilies. Until when the day blows and the shadows flee away, I myself will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hills of frankincense. Exactly what happened in his crucifixion. You are all beautiful, my love. There is no blemish in you. She comes out of the wilderness, made herself white. Every spot and wrinkle. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Sanir in Hermon, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with your eyes, with your chain of your neck. How much love Yeshua has. How much he's waiting for us to prepare ourselves. How much he's there just so excited for the wedding that's coming. How beautiful are your loves, my sister, my spouse. How much better are your loves than wine and the scent of your ointments than all spices. Your lips, my spouse, drip like the honeycomb. Honeycomb and milk are under your tongue, and the scent of your garments is like the scent of Lebanon. A locked garden is my sister, my spouse. A spring locked up, a sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with excellent fruits, with henna and spikenard. Exactly what Mary uh, put on his feet. Remember the Mary that was wiping the hair with the spikenard. But he's saying it's like a sealed fountain, meaning unlimited water, unlimited life of what is bright as spikenard and saffron and calamus and cinnamon and all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all the chief balsam spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, even flowings from Lebanon. Wow, can you imagine? He's writing this about his bride. He's writing this about his bride. Song of Solomon 6. Where, where have you, where has your beloved gone, most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned? For we seek him along with you. These are the bridemaids. Remember Matthew 25? You know the ten virgins, the bridemaids, they go to seek a bride and the bridegroom? Here's the bridemaids saying, where did he go? They also want to be with him. They're also excited about his return. And then what does the bride say? My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the terraces of spices, to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. And look what the bride says. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. He feeds among the lilies. Purity. That's what lilies represent. Purity. You know? Holiness. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Do you feel that way? Is your life, is every breath, is every day living for your bridegroom? Do you feel like, like a young 18-year-old bride again that you just can't wait for him to come and sweep you off your feet and bring you into eternity? Are you waiting every single day? Is that on your mind every single day? Do you pray to him this way every single day? When I first became a believer, for at least four or five years, because I was working a lot during the week, every Friday night, I would never take an invitation if, if one of the brethren would want to invite me over to the house. Because I'd always, I'd come home from work, I'd go get Chinese food, I'd close up my house, I'd unplug the phone, I'd put a, a, a plate on the other side of the table for Yeshua, and one for me, and that was it. I had a date. Every Friday was a date. Me and my bridegroom. And I loved it. I'd read my Bible, I would just be with him, and I loved it. You know, and today, here it is almost 30 years later, I still feel like I'm waiting with the same anticipation. And all the more now, because now he's 30 years closer to coming. The time is even getting closer than what it was before. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Song of Solomon 7. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter. Remember Romans 10, 15? How beautiful are the feet of those bringing the good news. What is he saying here? How beautiful are your feet in sandals. Meaningly, his bride is bringing that good news to other people. The curves of your thighs are like jewels. The work of your hands are an artisan. 
Your navel is like a round goblet. It never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Again, why is he saying this is all figurative speech? Filled with wheat, what is it showing? That there's bread, that there's, that there, 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 there's uh, grain there. And who is the bread of life? All this connected to him. Verse 10, I am my beloved, and his desire is toward me. His desire is toward me. Isn't it interesting? We read in Genesis that it's the woman's desire will be toward her husband. Here he says, our bridegroom's desire is toward us. He's waiting in anticipation greater than we're waiting in anticipation. Song of Solomon 7, drop down to verse 11. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us stay in the villages. Let us rise up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flowers and the blossom opens and the pomegranates bud forth. There I will give my loves to you. The love apples give a scent, and over our doors are all excellent fruits. New, also old, I have laid up for you, my beloved. How much fruit are we bearing for him? See, he has all this fruit that he's waiting for us. But are we also bearing fruit for him? John 15. That fruit is bringing the good news message to others. To bring more into the kingdom. Because it's life and death. Every single person that you bring into the kingdom is one less person who's going to go to the lake of fire. It is life and death. And the bride of Messiah is bearing fruit. Song of Solomon 8, verse 5. Who is this who comes up from the wilderness? Right, coming again from the wilderness. Who is this who comes up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? Where's Dolly? Gets back to your Edom scripture. <laughs> Where he's coming from, right? Who is this who comes up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree. There your mother travailed with you. There she travailed, she bore you. Revelation 12, we read it the first day, right? Set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as Sheol. Its flames are flames of fire, a flame of Yah. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will the rivers overflow it. If a man would give all the wealth of his house for love, they surely would despise him. Well, wow. can you imagine? Now the bride is ready. Now the bride is ready to give 100% of her. So in the beginning of Song of Solomon, the bride goes into the wilderness not ready. She's not bearing fruit, she's going down, her garden is all messed up, you know, she's black, but she's coming out of the wilderness, ready to give everything to her bridegroom. And once with the bridegroom, the bride can never be taken away from him. The bride can never be taken away from him. Luke 13, in verse 22. Beautiful book, Song of Solomon. Unbelievable, beautiful book about Yeshua and his bridegroom. Luke 13 and verse 22. And he would travel in the villages and cities while teaching, and he went to Jerusalem. And a man asked him, Master, are the ones being saved few? Pretty simple question, right? Not hard. Don't have to decipher it. Pretty simple. Are the ones being saved few? But Yeshua said to them, Labor to enter in the narrow gate. For I say to you that many will seek to enter in and will not have strength. From the hour that the master of the house rises and secures the door, then they will stand outside and knock on the door and begin to say, Our master, our master, open to us. And he will answer and say to them, I say to you, I do not know from where you are. Then they will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know you from where you are. Depart from me, all workers of falsehood. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of Elohim, but yourselves being thrust outside. And they will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will recline in the kingdom of Yahweh. And behold, there are last ones who are first, and there are first ones who are last. The bridegroom is getting ready to come out of his chamber, but many people are not preparing. Many people are not preparing. Like I read the other day, Matthew 22. You know that the wedding invitations are already written, they're already sent, but are you taking the invitation? Are you taking the invitation? 1 Corinthians 7, the last scripture I'll go into. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29. 1 Corinthians 7 is all about the marriage covenant. I'm not going to get into all of that, but I do want to go into one point of this in verse 29. 
Because when Paul was writing this, he was believing that they were in the last generation. He was believing Yeshua was returning very quickly. That's why he was telling single people it's better not to even marry. Later, when he realized Yeshua wasn't returning right then, he changed his tune a little bit. But while he thought that, look what he writes. He says, but I say this, brethren, that the time has been cut short. Let the ones who have wives be as though they have done. <coughs> was he telling us forsake our wife? No, not, not forsake our wife. But what he's saying is, now when he's returning, it's not the time for the 2.3 children in the white picket fence. You know, it's not the time to be making our life for the next 40 or 50 years in Satan's world. That's coming, the beast power. The time is to take your spouse and make the commitment toward Yahweh and his kingdom and work toward that. Not the white picket fence. He says, and those weeping is not weeping, and those rejoicing is not rejoicing, and those buying as if they did not possess. So again... He puts the money in your hand, you want to buy, go and do it, but don't possess. <clears throat> Hold it, but don't possess, because everything belongs to him. And those who make use of this world is not abusing it. For the mode of this world is passing away, how true it is. But I desire you to be, to be without care. The unmarried one cares for the things of the master, how to please his master. But the one marrying cares for the things of the world, how to please the wife. The wife and the virgin are different. The unmarried one cares for the welfare of her master, that she be pure in both body and spirit, but the married one cares for the things of the world, how to please the husband. And I say this for your benefit, that not that I put a snare or put a yoke before you, but I exhort, exhort you to be perfect before the master and faithful without destruction. And if he said this then, how much true is it now? And like I said, he's not against, you read the whole thing, he's, he's for the marriage covenant. He's talking about husbands and wives stay together. And what he's saying is, again, this is the time that two are better than one, you know? <laughs> For if there's cold, one can make them warm, and a three-cord string cannot be quickly broken. This is the time to work for Yahweh. This is the time to bear fruit for his kingdom, and this is the time to get rid of every spot and wrinkle. It really is the time. Do we know Yeshua? Do we love Yeshua? Do we have a real, ongoing, personal relationship? Because like I said, many of the things we believe, many of the doctrines that are in Scripture, many of the things He shared with us, they do set us apart, they sanctify us. But that in themselves do not make you holy. To be holy, you have to continue to walk what I talked about today. You have to utilize the fruits of the Spirit in order to get the gifts of the Spirit. You have to walk in holiness. Without, you will not see Yahweh. So if you want that relationship, and I think every one of us do, I mean, we wouldn't be here if we didn't want that relationship. Like I said, it's not just about rituals. We're human beings. We need rituals. Because rituals give us discipline. Rituals lead us somewhere. They're like signs. But in the end of the day, we have to know Him. We have to love Him. You have to have a real one-on-one -on -one personal relationship. You know, prayer, this is why He says you don't do repetitious prayer. Can you imagine if you were married to a husband or wife and they just said the same repetitious statement every day you came in? <laughs> I mean, how long would it be before you're knocking your head? <laughs> Prayer is about relationship. You know, we talked about yesterday. We said, how many people do you intimately know when you don't know their name? There's intimacy with your relationship with your Savior. There's intimacy in the Song, the, the song of Solomon. Read it. It's an intimate book. If it wasn't about Yeshua and his bridegroom, whoa! It would almost be, hey, should we even have this in here? You know, how it can romance or something, right? But no, it's a spiritual book. It's about the spiritual relationship about Yeshua with his bride. And as you're growing in that grace and knowledge of our Master Yeshua Messiah, that relationship should be getting stronger, it should be getting more love, and that love should be outflowing to other people. It should be outflowing first to your intimate family, and then to the brethren, and then to the world. That there should be a joy within each of us that can't be held. It can't be held back. I remember a couple of years ago when we lived in the kibbutz up north. I was in the store and this guy, that he had to have a demon. He was just real oh, wicked. He had a bad mouth. And I'm just standing there kind of smiling. And then he said to me, he said, what are you so happy about? <laughs> and I said, hey. I said, I got breath. And I was buying water. I said, I got water. I said, I got Elohim. What more do I need? <laughs> he just looked at me and goes, okay. <laughs>
But it's true. It's true that the joy that's in us, it should be overflowing. We should be able to bring to everybody with us. So again, the Bride of Messiah, you know, it's something that every one of us, like I said, somewhere along the line, if we have the Spirit, if we are first fruit, whether we're a guest to the wedding, whether we're a bridemaid, or whether we're in that inner chamber, all of us will be there at that wedding supper, if you're a first fruit. And we want to make sure that we're going to be there. We want to make sure we're making our garments white. We want to make sure we're building that relationship. And we want to make sure that we're not taking for granted being the bride of Messiah. Yahweh, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.